Welcome to Yo Elliot Live here on YouTube. And today, my guest is Rob Kowalski. And I met Rob because he had me on his channel back in 2020. I thought he was an interesting dude. And recently, I've been mentoring young men in relation to relationships. And one of the topics that came up was chastity. And so I remember Rob had a book called Why It's Better to Wait or Why Wait, Why Waiting Works, Why Waiting Works. And it mm -hmm. popped into my head. So let me introduce Rob. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some counterculture topics that I think are going to make their way back into the culture because we got to turn this degenerate boat around. So Rob is a self-professed reformed bad boy with a riveting personal testimony. From being born to a 15-year-old mother with no father in the picture to living as the most sought-after stripper <laughs> in his home state of Maryland and running the nightlife in the city of Baltimore that he grew up in. But the lifestyle took its toll, and at the age of 27, Rob had a change, had a life-changing encounter with Jesus that transformed him forever. He gave up a life of casual sex and addictions and founded the thriving non-for-profit City Fam with a mission to solve <coughs> loneliness. Now, he's considered the number one authority on sex, waiting for the right person, and overcoming loneliness in life during the wait. He's a best-selling author, coach, speaker, and host of Kowalski Analysis Podcast. His video entitled, 10 reasons not to have sex before marriage made him a viral sensation on YouTube and became the number one video in the world on the subject with 1.7 million views and climbing. But his role at Civity Fam and the global movement of friends with better benefits on a mission to end loneliness is closest to his heart. Rob, thanks for joining me, bro. Dude, it's an honor. Thank you for having me on, Elliot, seriously. Yeah, this was uh, put together really quickly because uh, I just hit you up yesterday after buying your book because I was sort of struggling with the guys in my class where, or they were struggling with how do I date without having sex? And I got a lot of these guys who are like, they can have sex. They have got, I have guys that are in there that uh, have no problem meeting women having sex, but they've seen the futility in it and it hasn't been beneficial to them. And so now they're struggling because they want to date, they want to meet girls, but at the same time, they don't know how to go about it. And so I, I checked you out and that's why we're here today, dude. So I think the best place to begin would be, uh, let's talk about your story, bro. Cause you were, you're not just like some regular uh, blue pill Christian dude who's like, don't sin because it's not in the Bible. You were actually quite a sinner as a stripper. <laughs> and you got, and sure. you're here now. So tell us about that journey, bro. Yeah, definitely. I'm trying to get my camera. For some reason, it got blurry on me. I'm not sure why. That's all Does right. that look okay to you? Yeah, you're looking smooth, dude. Okay, cool. On my end, it's a little blurry. So yeah, I'm, I was uh, I was born. My mom got pregnant with me at 14, and um, my dad was never in the same state when I was growing up. So you know, we were poor. We moved around a lot. She had different boyfriends. I never really had like a strong male role model in the picture. And I was pretty, probably pretty insecure because of it. And, uh, you know, I just kind of learned how to be a man from watching television and movies and no real, no one never talked to me about sex or anything like that. So I just kind of, at some point reasoned that if, you know, if I was good with girls, that that would kind of validate me as being a man. And I didn't, it wasn't a conscious thing I had. I just kind of thought I was girl crazy. But I, I looking back on it, I think I was trying to prove something. And uh, I, I, when I was like 15 years old, I found a, a videotape that my mom had rented of some male strippers mm -hmm. with her friends. It was on the coffee table when I walked in. I walked over, picked it up, put it in the VCR, and I saw these guys on the television taking their clothes off for money. And I remember at the age of 15, the, the instant thought that popped in my head was, that's what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> and it was like weird to think back because it's like, you know, most kids want to be cops and astronauts and all that. I wanted to be a stripper. So I became sexually active not long after that. And when I was 19, I started um, started working for this entertainment agency uh, just outside of Baltimore. And over the next couple of years, I started working for all the entertainment agencies and uh, was in the phone book and I was having tons of casual sex and but it was, it created a lot of problems in my relationships and, you know, to the point where I, 
I, I kind of started to wonder if I was like the kind of guy that could fall in love. Maybe I'm not the kind of person that can fall in love or maybe human beings aren't supposed to be monogamous. I had different theories for why I couldn't be all in on one because I was always looking over my shoulder at the next one wondering if I could be happier with them. Can I, can I back you up for a second? Sure. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your, your popularity as a stripper, though. You weren't just any old stripper. You were like, you say you were the top guy in your city, in the, in the state? Yeah, I would say probably in the state because there's not a whole lot of outside of Baltimore. But I was, yeah, I worked for a, every agency in Baltimore and I was the guy that they would give the dibs first, first dibs on the shows to. So I was doing like a lot of birthday and bachelorette parties, like 15 or so a week, maybe 20. But I was so also you working for really review. good. Like, uh, what, what makes, <laughs> I know this is a little strange, but I'm diving in here with you. What yeah. made you such an amazing male stripper? I think I think it was. I mean, I, I was built pretty good. I did some bodybuilding when I was 22. Yeah. I did the Maryland, um, so I kept myself in good shape. I always treated it like a job. I showed up on time, paid paid my commissions on time, and uh, I didn't sleep with the girls. Like there's guys doing some really crazy stuff out there. Like wow. they get they would get blown during a, a bachelorette party by the bachelorette. Like I heard, I'm like they actually paid you after. Really? I would ask questions. Like, yeah, dude, it was. I was, so I was never I was never like that. I always wanted to be untouchable a little bit, like leave after the show was over. And so I think that that probably helped me. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I just treated it like it was a job. I, I didn't, you know, I tried to separate business from pleasure. I mean, there was plenty of pleasure that came from it. Yeah, you were, uh, you were professional. You were professional. So this is a, maybe this is a question you don't want to answer, but this is a question that guys ask, and especially since you were in the industry, if you can give us a ballpark about how many women you were sleeping with or slept with over the years. So over the years, I think it was about 500. I, I actually, wow. I did, <laughs> yeah, I know it seemed right. Well, you hear about people like Will Chamberlain was like 10,000 or something. Right. And I was, it probably would have been a lot worse because I became a Christian at 27. So for six years, I, I, I was abstinent for six years. And now, now for the last 10 years, I've been abstinent. I have made two isolated mistakes over the last 10 or 11 years. But so that basically takes me out of the, for 16 years. So, you know, it was, it was a lot for these short windows. Yeah, you did it. You lived it up. And then, so something shifted. And you decided that this wasn't worth it. I remember I listened to your audiobook yesterday. I had it on on uh, times two, and I listened to it all in one shot. It's a great book. I love your stories, by the way. And That's I know fun. you mentioned like having these relationships with these girls that you thought were like your girlfriends. You, there's your girlfriend, but something wasn't right. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like started like dawning on you that maybe something was wrong with the way you were living. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that wake up period for you. Yeah. So for me, it was all Jesus. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 27 years old. I did not know God. I, I Are you went Pentecostal? I, you would, I would say I'm evangelical, I guess, or yeah, Protestant is what I think that you would probably call me because you're the Catholic. Because right? the, uh, the, the um, Pentecostals use that term a lot, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then they tar start talking in tongues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't even know what it was. I was. So for me, it was a really weird road to Damascus, you know about Paul's story, right? Yeah. So I, I was just, I was in Cancun, Mexico for spring break with a bunch of friends partying my ass off. And I woke up and God called me. I got baptized. I didn't even know what, what happened until later that it was called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I just knew God was communicating with me. I prophesied. He told me some things about future events. It was crazy. It was weird. It freaked my friends out. They all, you know, I, so when that happened though, I was a hundred percent sure from that moment that God was real. Jesus is who he said he was. And I needed to make some changes if I was going to, it wasn't even like I needed to make some changes. It was like taking the red pill. It was like, yeah. all of a sudden I was aware of the truth up until then. My God was pleasure. You know, YOLO, you only live once, right? I was like, I was going to have as much fun as possible because one day I'm going to be dead. And now all of a sudden I was like, oh shoot, you know, this, you don't only live once, you live forever and the, everything you do here matters. And I was, a, it was a big wake up call. So God in his infinite wisdom, he basically told me that, and this is, he told me that he had someone for me. He told me her name and everything. It was a girl that had moved to California a year earlier. He said, this is your person. Basically, I tried to call her and tell her to come back we're gonna get married like oh, whatever left her a voicemail she was dating somebody else she didn't call me back and i was like okay god i know he told me about about this girl i said all right i'm gonna wait 
I said, I'm going to wait for her, I'm gonna, you know, but I can't wait long. So you better hurry up and bring her to me. And I thought it was going to be a couple of weeks or maybe a month and that he, that, you know, she was going to call me and, and would fly back or whatever. And it turned into six years of abstinence. And so when I first started, I didn't understand the concept of waiting. To me, it was the, it was dumb. I you must like have had a lot of trust in God to wait six years for a girl. Yeah, I did. I had a ton of trust. Well, he, I do. My faith has always been strong from day one. I mean, I see, I saw some signs of God's power and I was like, well, God knows the end from the beginning. So if he's telling me this is the one, then I'm going to, I'm going to wait. And I did, again, I didn't think it was going to be long. I thought I could kind of manipulate him into like, you better hurry. Or I'm going to go out and have sex, you know, kind of thing. And, yeah. and <laughs> so it, what, you know, one month turns into two and next thing you know, it's been a year. And then it, I never thought it would be anywhere near that time. So, but in that, in that six years, I, uh, I really started to understand like sex in a way that I hadn't before. Cause like I said, in the beginning, to me, it was like, if a girl made me wait, I thought it was manipulative. I was like, yeah, she's right. trying to get me into a relationship or whatever. I just, I thought, you know, look, we're going to make each other feel good. Why would we wait? Sex is like a massage to me, basically. Right. So I, that's, and I even remember questioning God, like, why is it wrong in the beginning? Why is this wrong to have sex outside of marriage? So I didn't get it, but then I really started to get it over time. And then, Six years, six years into it, I, I backslid, they call it. I inadvertently fell back into sin, had a bunch more sex over the next five years, rededicated my life to God 10 or 11 years ago. And for the most part, I've been on the, uh, the refrain train ever since. Um, but yeah, in that, in those somewhere along the lines of living at those polar ends of the spectrum, I really just got, had a strong understanding of, of sex, the practicality of waiting, why I kept making the same mistakes why it was beneficial, not just for, for women, but for me to wait. Mm. And, and I, so I made that YouTube video that we talked about 10 reasons not to have sex before marriage and it went viral. And I really just feel like God gifted me with the ability to break down a complicated subject in a way that people can understand. So what would you say to a guy who maybe doesn't have the same faith as you? And so he doesn't have trust in God's natural and theological law. Sure. But you also say, that it's practical, like this is a good idea for men. What, why is it a good idea for men? Why is it practical for us to wait to have sex? Yeah, so many reasons. I think, so men and women, obviously, are, we're gonna do it for different reasons. Men, we're driven by accomplishment a lot of times. We wanna reach our full potential and you know, we wanna achieve on a high level. So there's a verse in the Bible that says, let, a, let no one be uh, sexually immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. So it's a verse in the New Testament. First time I read it, I was like, what What the hell does sexual immorality have to do with the story of, of Jacob and Esau? If anybody knows the story, Jacob was the younger brother. Esau was the older brother. Esau had the birthright, which means he had a double in, a portion of, it, of the inheritance. One day he comes in the house, he's hungry. Jacob's making some stew. Esau says, give me a bowl of stew. Jacob says, sure, just give me your, give me your birthright. And he trades it. He trades his birthright for a bowl of stew. And now in the New Testament, they compare that story to sexual immorality. And it got me thinking about why. Well, why would that be? Well, think about it. What is your birthright? Your birthright, I believe, is your purpose for being on this earth and the person that can help you get there. And what is, what is a bowl of stew? It's a piece of ass. Yeah. And you're going to trade it. for some, You're going to trade something permanent for something very temporary because in three hours, he was hungry again. Yeah. And he had traded the birth right away. It's so cheap. that's what we do when we have casual sex is we, so this is what, you know, a great book called Think and Grow Rich, Sex Transmutation. Napoleon Hill talks about how you can harness your sexual energy and you can redirect it to accomplish things. He talks about all these people of notable achievement have done this throughout history. So I, for me, if you look at what I've done in the last 10 years to what I did the 38 before that, it's not even close. I, I started nonprofits and wrote books and developed coaching programs. I did all this stuff because I had to do something with my sexual energy and I redirected it. And so I think guys, this is what happens for men. We, I believe that you're, we're supposed to find our per, purpose before our person. I 100% believe that. That's the way it was from Adam and Eve. Adam got it. He didn't get Eve first. If anybody doesn't know that, Eve got created later. Adam got created first and what he got was a job. Mm. And God said, name <laughs> like the animals, that. tend to the garden, name the animals. He got, he started doing his work and then Eve came. Okay. So th what happens with us is we don't want to wait. So we get our person before we get our purpose. 
We never harness that sexual energy and we drift into a relationship with the wrong person and we get this, this gnawing feeling that we're here to do something, maybe, maybe something more than the bullshit job we have, but we can't right. figure it out. And well, that's we're spilling our energy all over the place with women and porn and, and masturbation. So the, the purpose never becomes clear because we're clouded with sex. Exactly. And, and even, even if you do kind of figure it out, maybe you didn't pick the right person to come alongside you to help you do it because you weren't asking yourself the hard questions on the front end. So before when I was sexually active, I, I, I didn't really need to know much about a girl to go out with her. All I needed to know was, am I physically attracted to her? Because I knew we were going to have sex. So there was going to be a payoff. So that's all I needed to know. What would happen though sometimes is we would continue sleeping together and we would drift into a relationship. Mm -hmm. And then I would be looking over my shoulder at the next one, wondering if I could be happier with them because I didn't ask myself the hard questions on the front end. But I'd be stuck. I'd be unable to get out of that relationship because of the, the way the sex works. You right. get a soul tie, you know, oxytocin release, whatever you want to call it. And I'll just tell you the way it would work for me is I'd sleep with the girl as fast as she would give it to me. We'd continue having some of them. We'd continue having sex for a couple months. I would be playing the non-committal game as long as I could sleeping with other women, not telling them about it, but it would start causing too many problems in the relationship. And at some point I was, I couldn't do it anymore. I either had to make them my girlfriend or they were going to leave. And at that point I felt op number one, I felt a little obligated to them because they've been putting up my shit for the last three months. And I, I was like, they deserve to be my girlfriend. And then number two, I felt a little territorial over them. I didn't want somebody else having sex with them. Right. So I'd, I'd make them my girlfriend, but it was not a decision based out of the fact that I didn't think that out of love, like, you know, it wasn't a decision based out of, I don't think there's anybody else that can make me happier than this. Only when you remove sex from the equation, are you really able to answer the hard questions? Mm -hmm. are, is this the person for you? You know, when you know you're only going to get one of anything, you're going to evaluate it a lot more than you would if you think, oh, just it's just the next one. Would you say that there are a lot of guys that are in relationships right now that are stuck because of the sex? And then maybe if they stop having sex, they would get some clarity? hundred percent. So this is what I did with my ex-girlfriend. When I rededicated my life 10 years ago, God started convicting me of the sex. And, and I, I basically was prayed and I said, look, all right, God, I'm going to try this again your way. And if I'm not in love with her, convince me. But, and if I am in love with her, convince me that we'll get married. So I went and had a very intentional conversation with her and said, look, I'm not sure if we're built to last, but here's how we're going to find out. We're going to stop having sex. And if we become convinced we're in love, let's get married. But if we become convinced we're not in right. love, Let's not waste each other's time. So we stopped. And within about three weeks, the clouds parted. And we could both see clearly. We weren't going mm -hmm. the same places in life. We, we didn't even really get along. We had a good sex life, but mm -hmm. it was a shitty relationship. And we broke up. And then she, she got pregnant like a month later and, and moved out of state. And it was like God just kind of took her away, honored yeah. that prayer. I, I will honor your obedience if, if, you, if you let them. That's amazing. I say that to guys all the time. They complain about the relationship that they're in. They're not sure, but they feel some sense of obligation to this girl. They've been together for a long time and it's so simple, but yet it seems so difficult. Stop having sex. And like you say, I like the way you said that the clouds parted. And I, I imagine that there's even like a chemical association with that, right? Like, you know, we say, you say soul tie. I do believe in that but your body's constantly releasing all kinds of neurotransmitters and hormones that are sort of keeping you like in, a, in an addicted stupor, almost like an alcoholic who doesn't know he's an alcoholic till he stopped take, uh, drinking the alcohol. Yep. That, dr that exactly. sex is like a drug that makes guys drowsy and confused. Exactly, no, for real, you got a cocktail of hormones pumping through your body and you kind of feel like you're in love and maybe you're in love with the idea of them, mm -hmm. but until you remove the sex. So, I mean, of course, if you're married, listen, you're in it. You gotta, you gotta, it's, it's over. I mean, fight for that, stay in that relationship. But if you're not yet married, this is the best way to audit the relationship and see if it's real. What do you say to guys who argue that you need to have sex with a woman to get to know her? So, I mean, I feel like if you really get to know somebody outside the bedroom, then you add the sex in and then then, of course, it, you know, it's it's a, a bonus, if, if you will. But if, if if try before you buy. Right. That's what people argue. They say you got to take a car for a test drive before you buy it. OK, if that was so if that works so well, why is the divorce rate 50 percent when that's what everybody's doing? Right. Ninety seven percent of people are not waiting. So basically 100, you know, only three percent of people wait. 
and the divorce rate's 50%. So if that works so well, why is the divorce rate? Because I'll tell you why. Because you have sex with the girl and you do what happened to me. You drift into a relationship and you never ask yourself the hard questions on the front end and then you get stuck. My first girlfriend I spent five years with, I was not in love. I just couldn't get out of it. We broke up four years into it. I, I, it was very hard conversation, but I brought myself to tell her, I'm not sure if I'm in love with you. She started bawling, I was bawling, and then about a month later, we ended up breaking up. She started dating somebody else and it threw me into a deep depression. Because mm -hmm. I, I was like, because now she was dating somebody else and all of a sudden that soul tie yanked me and I wanted her back. So I started calling her and eventually I convinced her to come back to me and it was great for about a week. And then I went back to the original dynamics mm -hmm. where I was like, why in the hell did I do that? I was free. That lasted another year. Same thing. Tell her I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I'm in love with you. We break up. She starts dating somebody else. Again, same thing. I'm like super depressed. Come back to me. Let's get engaged. Mm -hmm. I'll quit stripping. I'll do whatever you want. Right. I just wanted the pain to stop. I knew that there's something was happening that I had no control over, but I, it, it, there was nothing I could do about it. It had me. And fortunately, she didn't come back. But I'm saying I see that happen so many times where you see people break up and get back together. And it's that soul tie. It's the way God wired sex. Sex is supposed to be a connection mechanism to help people cleave together and preserve the family unit through all the storms mm -hmm. of life. And when you, when you do it out of balance, then it just creates major problems in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just from your story alone, it's evident to me that it is the worst way to get to know a woman because you don't know her after you get addicted to her. You're clouded by the sex. And so these mm -hmm. guys think, oh, uh, I'm gonna get to know you by getting addicted to you, and then I'll decide if I wanna be with you, but at that point, you're already down that slippery slope. Either you, her, and here's the thing, yo, there's this idea that only women get hooked. Listen, I mentor to millions of men. I have thousands of them in my coaching program, and I'm watching these dudes just like girls, or worse, in fact, today, I think it's worse, get addicted to the sex of these girls, and these girls are like bouncing on them. They're leaving. I think the tables have, definitely the tables have turned, but I think as a byproduct of the tables turning, men now need to be the chased mm -hmm. partners. We're the ones that have to turn, be chased so that we can take back our power and stop letting sex and women through sex rule us. Yeah, so good. And I'll tell you what, when you, you come out with it and you make that decision, it flips girls' wigs. Mm -hmm. It just completely separates you from everybody else because they're like they're so just so not used to a man taking a stand in this area. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I point out to validating a man, them, yeah, and that's another. It's thing. an alpha move not to it validate is. a woman with your sex, right? The other thing I'd point out for a man is one of the points I made in the Ten Reasons video is that physical attraction fades. So most mm -hmm. people have heard the saying, "Show me the hottest girl in the world, and I'll show you a guy that's tired of fucking her." You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the reason that. that it the reason that is is because when you lead with physical attraction, it, it it doesn't matter how hot they are. If you don't have a deep connection with them, you will lose physical attraction to that right. person, regardless of how good they look. I, I know this for a fact. I dated beautiful women in my my life. One I can think of was my physical ideal. I literally every part about that girl, her, from the shape of her thighs or length of her eyelashes or lips or ass, everything was exactly like I like. I still didn't want to have sex with her after a certain point because our connection wasn't deep. And this is why that happens. So it's like what, what I believe, I feel like it's like the trick that God played on us, if you want to call it that, where he's like, okay, you don't want to wait. You want to lead with physical attraction. Watch what happens. Yeah. And you, you, you'll get, you'll have this hot person and you don't even want to have sex with them anymore. Right. Cause it was out of order. Yeah, because you did it out of order. It doesn't matter how good they look. This is, and the stats prove that I'm right because first off, the divorce rate's 50%, but if you make it past year four in your marriage, 50% of those people stop having sex on the regular. So that's your odds. That is literally your odds. Your odds of being happily married and a, a physical, you know, fulfilling relationship is not good if you do it the way that everybody else is doing it. Right, and because the connection isn't there. You said something in your book that I totally agree with. And I'm happy that you said it because sometimes I think I'm crazy. You said that if you wait for sex afterwards, you're developing the bonds first. You're developing the relationship first. You're developing love first. The sex is gonna be good. Right. How could I don't understand that these guys that say, oh, you have to find out what she's like in bed for the relationship to be any good. If the relationship is good, how could the sex be bad? 
Because these guys, the problem is that these guys are having sex just with their genitals. They're not having sex with their hearts. They're not having sex with their heads. They don't truly love. They're just blowing a load. And right. so they think that that's, you know, that's, that's somehow significant. But if there's love, if there's connection, you really are deeply bonded with this woman emotionally and mentally, then the sex is just naturally going to be great because it's, a, it's an act of your love. Yeah. Great relationships lead to great sex lives, not the other way around. Beautiful. You know, I, we've, we've all met people. Every guy out here watching this will relate to what I'm about to say. You meet a girl and at first you're like, oh, she's hot. She's, she's cute. And then for whatever reason, maybe you don't go out two or three weeks go by and then you start looking at them a little differently and you're like, yeah, she's good looking, but not for me. Right. <laughs> we've all been there a thousand yeah. times. Why? Because at that point you broke through the surface and now you're starting to see the person inside. Imagine though you slept with her in those first two weeks or three weeks. Right. And now you're in something complicated. So right. one of two things happen. You, you either break her heart or maybe she breaks yours or you drift into a relationship and you end up dating the wrong person or sp potentially spending the rest of your life with the wrong person, which I think happens a lot. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the reality of it right there. It's so what, what we're suggesting is pump the brakes, get to know the person. So this, this is, you know, the Bible says your heart's deceitful. This is why marriage is, is works. This is why I believe God gave it to us. The Bible says the heart's deceitful above all things, right? So, when I start talking about no sex before marriage, everybody's like freaks out because it sounds very extreme. If we were to propose to everybody, what about no sex before love? Most people go, well, oh, okay, I can get my mind around that. Great. All right, let's start there. How do you know if you're in love? Mm -hmm. What I believe is you'll marry the person to prove it. Because if I, if I was dating a girl and I said, Sally, I love you, let's have sex. And she says, I love you too, Rob. Let's just run down to the justice of the peace real quick. I'd be like, let me think about this a little yeah. longer. Right. Because I know that a divorce is going to be painful. Right. So I'm going to really I'm going to find out now if my heart's lying to me or not. Or did it, maybe I just want a piece of ass and I was lying to myself. But I'm going to find out now if because once I introduce that marriage into the conversation, it's going to change things. And that's the point, because God didn't want us to end up marrying the wrong people and drifting into a relationship with somebody and wasting our freaking lives. You make you you make me think about something. These guys who are all all very aware of. Uh, they're all very aware and scared to get married. There's a whole lot of fear around marriage these days. And you understand why, because you just said the divorce rate is phenomenal. It's ridiculous. And these guys are getting dragged through the courts. But for what I'm hearing you say, and what seems to be a logical connection to me, is that if we stop fornicating, stop having sex before marriage, there would be, there would be less of an incidence for divorce. 100%. If we want marriages to work, right? And that's the big that's the big complaint. Oh, marriages don't work. Oh, these girls they divorce. Oh, we're going to get divorce rape, then stop fornicating and that will fix marriage. But I do want to kind of touch this topic a little bit cuz I'm like you. Of course, you know, I am married, but I believe in marriage and family. I've been married going on 20 years. Um my relationship's great. It's amazing. I I I I recommend it. But <laughs> You know, there is, there is something to be said for the fact that married, the, the courts are stacked against guys, stacked against the man. We do live in a gynocentric world, female first, and a lot of women will take advantage. And of course, I'm thinking right away that you know, the, the, the way you deal with that is stop having sex with these bad girls, getting addicted to them, and then getting married. But what do you say to guys that argue that that's their argument, that, it's a, that marriage is a bad deal for guys? I think people have seen marriage done wrong for so long so the sexual revolution right people were out having sex with each other linking up doing exactly what i just said marrying the wrong people turns into a train wreck they're, the kids saw that mess and they're like oh man i don't ever want to get married i don't want any part of that so they think marriage is the problem a lot of people don't want to get married now if i was to say to everyone out there watching this how would you like to find your best friend that you're physically attracted to long term not just short term that can help you reach your purpose in life would you like to find her most guys would be like, hell yeah. Yeah. Don't have sex before marriage. It'll help you find her. That's it. It's not about being married. Marriage is semantics. It's about finding your person. Marriage just helps you do it. Not having sex before marriage helps you do it because you, you, the process of elimination, I don't know how many girls I've met in the last 10 years that I definitely would have slept with, but I could ask myself, is she everything you want? Pretty quickly, I could answer myself and say, no, she's not. I, I could tell. I didn't even need to really go on dates with them. Would I have slept with them? Absolutely. Right. Would I have ended up dating and maybe possibly even marrying some of them? Maybe. 
I don't know. I definitely would have probably got hemmed up with a few of them and wasted some time. So what I'm saying is it ain't easy. It's definitely not the easy way. But listen, delayed gratification is a real principle, and it's across the board for everything, everything. It applies to your, your health, your money, your education. There ain't one thing that delayed gratification doesn't give you long-term happiness in. It, there's no such thing as long-term happiness linked to instant gratification. It doesn't yeah. exist. So it, this is, it's true with sex too. It, it's, I'm, I, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I'm like, but it, it, it is the way it is. You, you, you know, know, you can't eat pizza and have a six pack. It doesn't work that way. Right. It's a sign of weakness in a world that has made fornication seem like a, a badge of honor. It's a sign of weakness. Cause like you said in your book, that whole study with the kids who didn't delay their gratification for the cookie or, yeah. or marshmallow or whatever, uh, they, they ended up growing up to be less successful adults. This, this instant indulgence and satisfaction is a form of weakness within men. It's a form of effeminacy. It is, in my opinion, I, I wonder if you would agree, that chastity is a uniquely masculine virtue. Absolutely, no, I 100% agree with that. It takes a real man. I look at someone like Tim Tebow and I, I say that he's a real man. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he had it all. He could definitely have gone out and slept with anybody he wanted and he didn't. He didn't buy into the culture's bullshit, you know, he yeah. didn't believe all the lies. So no, a hundred percent agree. You also mentioned, so we talked a little bit about, you know, the negative effects of uh, fornication and how it destroys future marriage beds. I even like when you said in your book, you said that you're sleeping with somebody else's wife. That made me cringe. I was like, ugh. You even gave another analogy. I love your analogies. You gave another analogy, you said testing women out is like, opening up the can of milk at the store or the bottle of milk at the store and putting it back and somebody else has got to go buy that as terrible. So we know all the negative, all the negative side effects, but you also state some very positive statistics in marriage for those who wait. Tell us about the, the, the benefits for those who do wait and how the statistics uh, skew in our, in our favor. Yeah, there's there's plenty of studies that were done on it. Uh, secular studies controlled for religion, people that weren't even, you know, Christians or whatever, no faith. And it's the same across the board that the longer you wait, the better the uh, the relationship satisfaction, the better the sex life is, yeah. lower the divorce rates. I think the divorce rates for virgins is six percent. I read where the divorce rates for everybody else is 50. So, like, there's a reason for that. So, yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, there's tons of information. If anybody wants to pick up a copy of the book, I have tons of data in there, mm -hmm. coupled with my own, my own stories to back up everything that they're saying. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend your book. Well, let's let's plug it real quick. It's actually right behind you there. Why yeah. waiting works. There it is. Yeah. How fast sex prevents us from finding long term uh, finding true love and long term happiness. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask something, but I forgot. Let me go back to my, uh, my list here. Oh, man. I had a really good question on tip. Uh, but I have a list here. So what would you say to a guy who's practicing chastity? He knows that it's a manly virtue. He knows he can have sex. And he's dating a girl. And she's not privy to this new movement. She doesn't get it. What do you say to a guy like that when he starts to sense, oh man, I'm never gonna find a girl because all these girls want, it's almost like the tables have been turned, it's so funny. All yeah. these girls want is sex, and so they don't take me seriously. What do you say to a guy like that? Yeah, I, you know, I think there are a lot of women out there that are jaded. I think it, inherently they do want it. They do want the fairy tale. They want, a, a, you know, Prince Charming to come and sweep them off their feet and all that, but there's nobody out there doing it. So they kind of convince themselves that they don't want that maybe. So when I tell women, very rarely do I get a negative response from it. For me, if a girl's not waiting, it's actually a pretty big turnoff because I'm like, I have been waiting and now I want someone that's been waiting and doing the work on themselves that I've been doing. But yeah, I mean, I, I can understand for sure what you're saying because you think, you know, if I plant the flag, uh, you know, you, you're going to get them hooked on you. Right. And you're probably right. More than likely you will. But maybe you don't want them to be. You know, so like, right. I feel like you're going to attract what you are, not what you want. So when I was out sleeping around, I dated some crazy bitches. You know, it was <laughs> crazy relationships, cheater. You know, just that's who I was. So I didn't attract a good girl that I was going to be able to really probably settle down with for the long term. 
And even if I did, because of the place I was at in my life, I probably would have sabotaged it inadvertently. So I would say, if you are that kind of man, you're going to attract that kind of woman. And even if she hasn't been waiting, I believe that if she's the right girl, she's going to be on board for it. Yeah, you uh, you weed out the ones that you really wouldn't want anyway. And I was trying to explain it like this to the guys. I was like, if she's truly a feminine woman and you're holding your masculine frame, because I think that this is a very strong masculine frame. Like a lot of guys think that by I think by they think that by being chased that they're retreating from sex. And I said, no, 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 you're not retreating from sex. If you think you're retreating from sex, she's gonna get that vibe from you and you're gonna look weak. <clears throat> you're you're penetrating her with virtue. <laughs> I said, mm. let put it that way. You're effing her with your virtue. You're putting it on her with your virtue. That's a totally different attitude associated with it. And if you come at it with that sort of, that masculine attitude that I am pursuing virtue, I'm not running away from sex, uh, mm -hmm. that if she's truly a, a feminine woman and worth your time, she's gonna follow your lead. She might not be yeah. used to that. She might be like dumbfounded and like, wow, this is the first time I've ever heard this, but this man is just so damn manly and convinced and has got that compelling conviction that I must follow his lead. Yeah, I think automatically when you come out with it and you take that firm stance that it, it is very attractive to a woman they, because you're automatically going against the culture. And you're okay, like, you're like, and you don't give a shit what anybody thinks about it. That's, yeah. the way I, that's the way I'm at, at with it. But when you were talking, it reminded me of this movie I saw called Redeeming Love. Did you ever see that? No. It's worth checking out. It's basically a, a movie that was based off the book of Hosea. I don't know if you, Hosea was a prophet and God told him to marry a prostitute. Oh, man. So they remade, <laughs> yeah, they made it into a movie, but it's set in like the Wild West. So the guy marries this prostitute because God tells him to, and she's just, you know, slept with thousands of guys or whatever and she's she's content she wants it and he won't sleep with her because he doesn't want he doesn't want to just effort he wants to he wants to make love to her and he wants to show her like because she was really abused bad as a kid so he's trying to wait till the moment's right and it's just it was just a really cool story about you know how they end up falling in love and then having kids it was beautiful i actually cried when i watched it but it reminded me of what you're talking about where that's the kind of story that you want you know to write with a woman and I just, there is really an, an enemy out there. There's a, the enemy's real, there's a mm -hmm. devil and he, he w doesn't want you to have it. I believe the sex is gonna, I, I've never been in love, but I believe when it happens, the sex is gonna be probably better than any sex that I've ever had. I don't care what tricks the girls knew or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be the same as making love to the person that you're mm -hmm. in love with. Right. And they'll, yeah. And when it comes, when it boils down to it, sex is cheap. So what, if you're in love, you have that deep bond, that real connection, that oneness with that person. To, I mean, what is sex? It's it's de it's what animals do. My dogs, my dog wants to hump, <laughs> right? But he can't have conscious love. Animals can can bone. They they'll just hump anything. What does that make us? There's no pride in that. That's our lowest. That's our most base instinct. I do have a question though about courtship and marriage. So, you know, we live in this time, of course, you know, where we're fornicating and we're cohabitating and we're doing all the things that don't work, even though we think they do work because it's pleasurable, it's easy, expedient and effeminate. Um, so that leads to a situation where people are together, right? My, my boyfriend, and I think it's the funniest thing when these people are like 30, 40 years old calling their, their, their significant other boyfriend and girlfriend. Boyfriend is for teenagers. You're not a boy, you're a man. Is that your man friend or a boyfriend? It's my girlfriend, it's a woman. So it's, it just tells you how immature the whole dating idea is that we say boyfriend. I know this 60 year old woman was talking about her boyfriend. I was like, you kidding me? You got a boy? But anyway, that's me ranting a little bit. So these people stay together, like playing marriage for years, even young people, years. Oh, we've been together for six years. In my mind, I'm like, what are you doing? So my question to you is, what do you think is a appropriate amount of time to get to know somebody through the courtship before marriage and then bedding down? I think you could, um, 
you know, I've thought about this a lot for myself because I'm always like, even if I meet her today, when, when will be the next time I have sex? You know, like I have those thoughts, but I, I feel like you could, you could know in a relatively short amount of time, I could see myself getting married within six months. Yep. You know, meeting the person for sure. Jackie Dorman, uh, she's a dating coach and she interviewed all these couples that had these really long, successful marriages. And she said they all had one thing in common. I said, what was that? She said they all met and married within four months. I was like, wow. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So like, I guess it's like, look, when you know, you know, kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the beauty of removing the sex from the equation is because you are evaluating the relationship on a whole different level when you're not having sex. Right. That's why anybody out there that's doing it, I say, have that intentional conversation because look, it's like this. I want to have sex again. I know you want to have sex again. And if we're really in love, let's get married. But if we're not, right. we're going to break up. I want to find the person that I am in love with so I can have sex again. It just puts the relationship under a microscope. You don't look at it like that when you're having sex because you're meet, meeting each other's basic physical needs. But back to something you said about sex a second ago, the studies show that we only have sex 0.45% of, of the time, 99.55% of the time we're not having sex. Hope you like the person. You know, like yep. if you're basing it off of how good they are in bed, what about the 99.55% of the time you're not having sex? Do you really like being around them? Right. Can you go on a long car ride with this person? Are they your best friend? Like the way to find that out is not through sex. You can't find that out through sex. Have you ever so, heard of this uh, this book called Cupid's Broken Arrow? No. It's written by this lady. I can't remember her name. It's not a great book, but the concept is great. She's married to a neuroscientist, and he did all these studies. He's he had a very popular uh, TED TED talk about what happens in the brain when you're on porn. And how it like it mm. destroys a guy's brain. It's almost like he's on heroin. Well, she went and ran with that in terms of sex. And so she built this whole thing around sex. And she just asserts that when we orgasm together, that's when we start to wear out our time with each other. She says, she says that um, that's why people start getting turned away from each other because of too many orgasms together. So she suggests mm. something called Carezza sex. She says it's better it's better to have sex without orgasm because it keeps you together it keeps you together longer for some some reason. She says there's no um there's no hangover after the after blowing your load. I think guys call it like a post nut clarity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's like a right. hangover. It's like you know after you blow your load and immediately you're like I can't stand this girl. Uh -huh. And so anyway, I just wanted to bring that up, but uh, I do have another question. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say it's almost like when you're when you're diet and then you eat a pizza and you're like, shit, <laughs> well, as yeah. soon as you get full, you're like, why did I do that? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's gross. It's like, ew, ew, what am I doing? Why am I here? What are we doing? I, know. Mm -hmm. I could just imagine. Um, let's talk about marriage in terms of what you're so you're a Christian. <laughs> And so I remember reading in your book, you talked about how God married, even in the Old Testament, you know, if you look at like uh, Isaac and Isaac and Rebecca, like they slept together and that made them married. That was it. He, she went into mm -hmm. the tent with him and he went inside her and that was it. Married. Mm -hmm. That was it. No ceremony. And, yeah, no ceremony. You mentioned that even with Adam and Eve, there's no ceremony. He just gave him his wife. So what are your thoughts on the requirements for for validating a marriage between people right like do we have to go through the state right is that a legitimate marriage do we does it have to be sanctioned by the church or can it just be a solemn agreement contract covenant between two people and God in front of those that they know. Like there's, it's, so, it's kind of arbitrary and I'm wondering if we could remove some of the barriers to it so that people are not so averse to marriage. I think for me, the, the main reason that it works is it has to be hard to get out of. There has to be mm. some type of pain if you don't fulfill the covenant, right? So like, I imagine if you had a sister and, and their guy started dating her, he's like, you know, I, I really love your sister. I want to spend the rest of my life with her, great. You can, you can sleep with her, but if you decide that you don't want her at some point, I'm going to kill you. Like that would work, that would work the same as marriage because they would be like, shit, that's going to hurt, right? Um, so I think it's the same thing. So if you, just, if you were just to make a promise, you know, fate or whatever, Facebook status, any of that stuff can be changed so easily, <laughs> right? Like that's why we don't marry is because, oh yeah, I'll live with you. You know, we can be boyfriend, girlfriend. I'll live with you because you know you can get out of it. And you kind of want to keep your options open because you might meet somebody better down the road, you're thinking. That's really what it's about. That, but I, 
in order to, to really find out what your heart's telling you, like, no, this is the one. I'm not going to find somebody. I don't want anybody else. Okay, great. Prove it. Talk is cheap. You know, like we can think lots of things. We can tell women, yeah. you know, I love you. I used to think that there were certain women I'd be like, I'm really into this girl. I really like her. And we'd have sex and pff, gone. Whatever feeling I thought I had for him. And they talk about Dawn Masler. Uh, she made a great TED talk called How Your Brain Falls in Love. And she talks about the oxytocin release. And she says, women release oxytocin when they have sex. Men don't release oxytocin when we have sex. We release oxytocin when we commit. What's the oh. ultimate form of commitment? The ultimate form of commitment is marriage. Interesting. Right? So that, which is why God had it right. Because if you think about it, wedding night, woman gives her body, man gives his last name. The two people release oxytocin. They cleave together, which is what the Bible says. They, they, they glue together. And now they, they're a family unit. And guess what? They're probably going to make it. They're going to they're gonna be able to make it through all the storms. But what happens now is you sleep with that girl. She releases oxytocin. You don't. So now, now she's clingy. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why men can hit, you know, hit it and quit it a lot easier than women. <laughs> yeah. but, that now, but now you're in a position of control, and we think we like that, right? We're like, oh, yeah, well, that's good because, you know, I got her on lock, right? But what happens is it creates a, an interesting dynamic and to the point where at some point, you start feeling obligated to her because mm -hmm. you know you've been taking something from her and not giving what you're supposed to give, which is the commitment. So at some point, you're kind of forced into it, and that's what I call the sex trap. Where you, and it happens to people all the time where you, you, you know, it happened to me several times. First girlfriend, mm -hmm. five years. Second girlfriend, I was, I was like so determined not to be in a relationship. I just started promoting. I was having sex with all these different women. I was like, nope, not again. That's not going to happen to me again. Slept with the girl, continued having sex, exact same thing. Drifted into a relationship, looking over my shoulder, thinking, well, maybe this is what it's, maybe this is why they say relationships are hard. No, yeah. it's because I didn't wait. Right. Yeah. A perverted relationship is hard. <laughs> when we do it the wrong way, it's hard. That's amazing. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. I'm seeing a movement back to tradition. I don't know if it's because I live in a bubble and so the people around me are this way, but I'm watching especially Gen Z. They're becoming very disillusioned with the degenerate lifestyle that has been unfolding since at least the 1960s. And I think it peaked with the millennials. And so you know that cycle, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. I think that cycle has come full circle and that's why they call them gener Generation Z because it's, it's the last generation. And I think this is the generation that is going to be the strong men. And so that's why I'm seeing a lot of movement back to tradition. It's amazing how many men are coming back to Christ. What are your, what are your thoughts on what the next 10 years are going to look like in terms of uh, the sexual marketplace and how, uh, how men are going to carry themselves and how things are going to move forward for marriage and family? Yeah, I, you know, you and I talked about this yesterday a little bit. I, I do think the pendulum is always swinging, and it definitely swung so far, you know, to the right, or should I say the left, that it has to come <laughs> back, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I feel like we are seeing a return to that. Like, even people like we mentioned Tim Tebow, but there was that bachelor that was a virgin. I had a guy on my podcast named Mitchell Eason. He was on Netflix. He's a virgin. There's people out there that are leading the charge. Uh, so I do feel like that we're going to return to conservative values at some point it, it, it doesn't work you know the, mm -hmm. all these crazy leftist ideologies they don't work so eventually your people hit bottom and they realize whether it's through depression or whatever else that it's not working and they 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 have to look up this is why i believe that when god talks about you know if you're lukewarm i'll spit you out of my mouth because mm -hmm. he'd rather us be hot or cold if you're hot obviously it's a good thing you're red hot but if you're cold at least you're going to probably hit bottom because you're when you're cold, but when you're when you're lukewarm, you just kind of teeter along and you never hit bottom. You just kind of you don't do so good, so great, but you never do that good, you know. So I think right now everybody's so cold in 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 relation to like values that we we have to we have to hit bottom at some point. Right, it's only inevitable. Yeah, we spoke yesterday. It was pretty cool linking up with you. You said something yesterday too that um, I think will be very valuable to my listeners, and maybe we'll f find some way to unfold this, but. You know, I think more and more men, I, I lead mostly men, it's mostly men in my community, it's all men in my community, and you know, mm -hmm. maybe about 93%, maybe 97% of who watch me here. And so I'm watching the men grow, I'm watching them grow up, I'm watching them return to tradition, and they're complaining about the women. 
And yesterday, you know, because I live, I live on this side of it, you live on that side of it, and you're like, I have all these women that are committed to chastity, they're committed to being virgins, make virgins great again. I think, I think virginity is gonna come back as a virtue. I think that's awesome. Um, how do we get my guys, my virtuous chase guys linked up with all the, all the virgins and the good girls <laughs> on your side? Yeah, we should have a dance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. a ball. <laughs> a courtship ball. I, actually, I posted that I was coming on this with you in the group. So I have a Facebook group called the Waiting Works Community, and it's 3,600 people, and it's probably 95% women or whatever. And, um, you know, that we had had this conversation. And so I would suggest to all the men out there, if you're serious about following this path, join that Facebook group. Again, it's it's at least not, you know, nine to one, 10 to one. Um, wow. But, and are these yeah. girls... Like um, okay, I don't want to be I don't want to be like, rude, but are these like born again virgins, like girls who are like forty years old and it's like yeah they rode the cock carousel for twenty years and they're like I had enough of this I want a good man or is it like try like really actually you know fresh young virgins that want to stay that way till they marry? It, it's both for sure. It's definitely some born again virgins. It's people that made mistakes and yeah, that's fair. Not, that way, that way sure. doesn't work. But I think it's a variety. I don't know what the, if it's more one or the other, it's mm. hard to say, but there's definitely some, there's definitely some good looking women in there. I mean, yeah. Um, if, if, if someone was serious about their wife, it would be a good place to fish. Yeah. Yeah. I believe <laughs> you. I think we will need to link up and create some sort of a project, even if it's just a, um, just a meetup of some sorts. Right. Where do you live? You're in Maryland, right? Yeah, yeah. You're we're, in Florida. Yeah, we're both here on the on the on the East Coast. Maybe we could do like a meetup. We'll call it uh, the courtship ball. And I have my guys who are looking, and your girls. And I tell you, man, the truth, a big part. I got to be just completely transparent. You know, uh, I do what I do, and I just move from my heart. Uh, but a big part of my heart is my family, and I want to see my children be able to live in a world where my daughters can find good husbands. And I knew that the only way that would happen is if we go back to tradition. I want my son to be able to find a good wife. And so I like to see that, you know, guys like you and me, we're leading the charge and we got people who are listening to us because our children and our children's children are the ones that are gonna reap the benefit of this as the world mm -hmm. makes its turn. Yeah, it's good. I think also too, if you know, if there are any believers out there, uh, fear is a good motivator. You know, like the way the world's going, to me, the writing's on the wall that Jesus is coming back. And um, there's definitely verses in the Bible that talks about fornicators don't inherit the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I initially turned to God, it was all because of, you know, I was scared. I was like, uh, I, wanted, I didn't want to miss out on heaven or whatever comes after this. And I think that that's real. You know, I think God didn't say those things, you know, for no reason. So. Whatever, whatever sin is in your life, you should be trying to get it out, especially now, because things are getting weird. Yeah, and you said something, uh, I think you quoted Anley Stanley or something, but I've heard, I've heard uh, Father Ripperger, who is an exorcist, say this, and he, both of them assert the same thing, that the majority of the people that are struggling today uh, with darkness in their life, it's due to sins of the flesh. 99% of the sins that are calling, causing people to fall are, uh, are related to sins of the flesh. I mean, be it fornication, which is just ever present, pornography, ever present, masturbation, ever present, all kinds of uh, sins of the flesh. So I think, you know, we're, what's happening right now on the planet is, uh, is, is we're getting to see that be all cleaned up so when the Lord returns, he can have his harvest of virgins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wants right, his bride. It says in the Bible, right, that that the virgins have a high place in heaven. I, yeah. I know that's Catholic theology, but I think it's biblical too. That virgins hold a high place in heaven. Well, he compares the uh, he uses. There's a parable of the virgins with the lanterns. He talks about being the virgins that are waiting, like that are prepared for when the groom ret returns. And mm -hmm. That's him, right? So he wants us to be ready, and he does use the analogy of virgins. Um, yeah. But yeah, to me, there's an there. Even if people try to deny it, that there's something um, inherently valuable about a virgin. People are very interested when somebody comes, like Tim Tebow. They're like, just very interested in that. 
you know, the, the, I had a girl on my podcast, 29 years old virgin. She was a cheerleader for the dolphins. And lots of stories about her. People will just know that there's something valuable in that. Even yeah. if they try to deny it. Right. Everybody, everybody knows, every, everybody knows it inside. But, you know, it's, it's counterculture, so it's hard to say outside. Well, Rob, do you, I assume you pray. You're a I man of a prayer. Lot. Would you be willing to lead us in a closing prayer? Yeah, dude, I'd love that. Yeah, I would love if you did that. Great. And then we'll, tell uh, we'll wrap up. Okay, cool. Um, if I want, before we do that, I just want to tell everybody, if they want to pick up a copy of the book, it's at whywaitingworks.com. They just pay for shipping and handling. There's even a study guide that goes along with that. And um, we actually have some groups that are getting together and, uh, you know, wrestling with the idea of waiting and starting even to do life together, doing social events and service events. That's really kind of what City Fam's about. But um, sure, let's, let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for opening the door and uh, allowing me to come on the show and speak with Elliot. God, thank you for the introduction to him and just the, um, the friend, really, that he's been to me and um, just the, the platform that you gave him, God, and just getting this message out. God, we really believe that you're doing something new in this season um, and we're grateful to be used and be part of it. God, I'm praying that everybody that sees this, that they would remember the things that they saw, that they heard, that they would chew on them and God, that you would show them uh, that, that they're true through different things that are happening in their life, giving them the courage to actually step out and try these things. And as they do, God, as they, they wrestle with these ideas and and try to put them into practice, God, that you would show up in their lives in a greater way, that they would see um, the things that they're working on in their personal and professional lives just start to excel, God, because you're honoring their obedience. God, I pray that that people would meet their wives uh, that are waiting, God, that, that you would um, have their paths crossed because they're, they're trying to do it your way. They're not relying on... Um, sex or whatever else to try to find their person, but they're, they're trusting in you. And, um, Lord, I just pray that everybody that uh, needs to see this message would, that you would have it, uh, pop up on all the right people's feeds and, um, continue to bless Elliot and his ministry. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My brother, thank you so much for taking your time to be on the show with me. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. You have two books. You have Why Waiting Works and The Truth About Sex. I haven't gotten around to that one, too, but I will. And uh, that's, just the, that's just the study guide for the book, really. Oh, OK. Very good. And you have uh, and you have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we can check you out on YouTube. You've got a viral video. Ten reasons why waiting works, correct? Ten reasons not to have sex before marriage. Before marriage. Very cool. Well, Rob, it's been a pleasure, dude. We're going to link up soon, and uh, I'm sure we'll do some projects together we got to get our, our our dudes and our girls together that'd be awesome man thank okay, you man god bless